thank you for coming. I hope you guys are enjoying it today, right? So paradigm shift, a fundamental way in a change of thinking or doing things. And this is not your father's Zoom lenses. And this is an educational program. I want to tell you exactly how to do birds in flight. And it's going to require some things that aren't gear, things in your control as a photographer. But a little housekeeping. I was here last year. And for you guys on YouTube last year, I have feelings, by the way. They said a little less Roman and more of his images, all right? I agree with them. Video guys have been warned. More of my images, less of me. All right, so I got that out of my system. So I've been doing this for over 30 years. Um, when I first started out, I do landscape photography, macro photography. For me, the true test of a lens starts with wildlife photography. It's like the Wild West. Fast shutter speeds, things firing, big, huge glass. Well, that's all changed in the last five to 10 years. It's no longer the realm of that big glass. So bird photography, why? The true test of any lens for me, if, if it's sharp, is birds. Why? Because they're fast, they move fast. And anybody can take a picture with a cell phone now of a stationary subject if we're close enough, right? Selfies with animals. But the real true test for me and what's changed is both the performance and affordability of these lenses. So I'm a Sigma Pro for, ten, uh, for three years now, I wish 10. Most of the images or a lot of the images you're going to see are with the Sigma 3 to 800, affectionately known as my Sig Monster. 13 pounds, 10 years I own that thing, I love that thing. But I've put in on the bottom when I've used other lenses so we don't have to stop and talk about the gear because what I want to talk to you first, the biggest mistake I see bird photographers, wildlife photographers make, time of day. This has nothing to do with your gear. You need to be out there a half hour before sunrise, two, two and a half hours after sunrise, two and a half hours before sunset to a half hour after. That's the beautiful light. That's when you're going to get images like you're going to see here. When the sun first rises, it's that beautiful orange glow, right? We get that. Your shadows are longer and soft. So you need to be out there. As it starts getting high and gets that you know, harsh light, stop shooting. Go scout. Go take siesta time. So that orange glow, I know, I, I always see people taking that saturation layer and blasting it through the roof in post-processing. Well, I know what time of day it was by the shadows. You can't fake whether this is sunrise light first thing in the morning coming up. You can't fake that. Later in the evening with storm clouds. So these are things I'm going to teach you how to do. And equally as important, sun at your back. You can shoot cross light. You can shoot backlit with practice. But when you first get out there, put your hands out like this. Anything in that zone is fair game to photograph. If it's in a different direction, move yourself physically. Morning or light, look how soft the shadows are on my subject. And those are things that you want to do. So I'm combining the zone, time of day. That has nothing to do with my gear. That's on you, the photographer. And I find the most underutilized tool in the camera bag is you. I leave my locations in Yellowstone a lot of times at 9, 9.30. I run photography tours, Roman, Roman photo tours all over the world. I take four people. I'm leaving the park at 9.30. Traffic jam is building to come in. So birds, they are some spectacular creatures. And they even get more iridescent at the right time of day. So I want you to keep that in mind. 
And these are some of my favorite birds. I mean, look, I'm combining time of day, late low light, sun at my back, almost no shadows on the spoonbill. And it's just beautiful. So let's talk about composition, shooting angle, head angle, backgrounds. Again, all things in your control, not with your gear. You don't want a busy background. If you have a bird and a bush behind it, you don't want the bush to compete with the bird. Portrait photographers, we're taught not to shoot up or down at people. Well, the same thing goes for birds. If the bird's this big, hate to break it to you, you need to sit down or lay down. You don't want to shoot up or down at it. And then head angle. That's on you too. Wait for it to be in the right position. So we pulled up on this lilac breasted roller out in Tanzania. There was a thorn bush behind them. We moved five feet from the vehicle up five feet. We all had the golden grass as a background. I like my dark backgrounds here. This is mangroves. And that first morning light, sun at my back, no competition with your subject. Now, in the mangroves, they nest. I try to shoot, and we'll talk about the exposure, how because I shot and exposed correctly for the white, the mangroves go dark, and it's all about the birds. So time of day. Now, shooting down, drop your tripod. Sit down. I'm not the guy who's gonna lay down on the ground. I have six herniations from 25 years construction. I might not get up, you know? But also longer focal length helps with the angle, but just drop your tripod. Burrowing owls in Cape Coral, Florida, they're nine inches tall. You need to sit down. No hate emails. Watch where you sit in Florida fire ants. You've been warned. <laughs> All right? Ducks in the pond. I see people going to zoos. You know, even our local zoos have these ducks in ponds at time of the year. And I see everybody putting their tripod up this high. No, you got to sit down. Bring a garbage bag with you so you're not sitting on any of the poop. You got to get lower. You got to shoot at their angle. I go to Florida three, four times a year for my workshops. <laughs> I'm, from, I'm a Jersey boy, lived here my entire life. You know, I, the Florida captain is telling me, you know the water's 65 degrees. I said, dude, the water doesn't get to 65 degrees in my area ever, I don't think. I'm going in the water. He's got a down park on, it's 50 degrees, it cracks me up. And again, the longer the angle, I just took this a couple of weeks ago. I am minimizing shooting down. Now, shooting up on the focal length, you know? When you shorten that focal length up, you're shooting up the tree. It's just not the most pleasing composition user. So, look what happens when I use my 3 to 800. Well, not everybody's going to have a 3D 800, and we're going to talk about gear, but when I go to Florida and I want to shoot some airborne shots, I go to the fishing pier. Why? These guys love flying by the pier at eyeball level. Most birds will fly low as well. So these guys are cruising just above water height. So I'm standing on the beach. Actually, this is on the boat from my tour, and we're just shooting directly at them eyeball height. Head angle. I am a card-carrying member of the head angle police. What does that mean? Anything from a profile to right at you and everything in between I like. I don't want to see the go-away bird. I don't want to see the back of the head. Portrait photographers never show the back of the head. Neither should you as a bird photographer. So one of the nicest profiles in the bird community, slightly at you to right at you. Now realize this, the more heads you introduce into a scenario, the degree of difficulty goes up. 
So I want you, if you take anything from this program, control what you can as a photographer. What does that mean? I'm looking at these guys. All right, I composed it, got the dark mangroves, got the nest, good. That's all great. Now, I can't pay attention to every head. These chicks are wah, 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 doing all sorts of crazy stuff nonstop. Well, when I see mom lift her head in the correct position, I fire the button. Brr, brr, brr. Just because you can't control where all the heads will be. Memory has gotten cheap today. How many of you in this room have that 512 megabyte car that you probably paid $200 for? They're, they're really inexpensive even for 128 gig cards. Don't be afraid to use them. So like I said, all these things, how far do you think I had to go for this image? Front yard, three feet out of my dining room. I actually shot this with the 180 macro. I had to build a blind inside my dining room, three feet, to photograph this. So not everything is exotic. We do have a lot of shorebirds and other birds around us from now throughout most of the time. Then we get vi winter visitors as well. So what are the common, the number one problem Somebody comes up to me and says, my bird images are soft. It must be the lens. That is usually culprit number 10. Usually culprit number one is you. It can be soft because, you know, camera shake, motion blur. Birds fly at an average cruising speed. Again, we're going averages here. 20 to 40 miles per hour. Well, usually small and big cruising speeds. They can reach speeds from anywhere in a fight situation, 60 to the Peregrine, 200 miles per hour in a dive. So we need speed here to do this. Depth of field is usually not the culprit, and we'll talk about that. But usually, you never acquired focus. So let's look at this bird. This is probably shot at 6.3 F8 max. Notice the wing position here. Notice the wing position on all my birds. It's not like this, straight out, up or down, down like this. So think about it, at a distance of about 100 feet that I can fill the frame at 600 millimeter, I probably have six feet of depth of field or thereabouts at F8. It's in there. So depth of field usually isn't a problem. Even when this guy's coming at me, how much depth of field do I need? Two feet? Right? So rarely is depth of field a problem, and I usually tell people wide open to F8 is usually good, more than enough for the birds, and just don't get closer. When I move that 800 millimeter close, 21 feet away, I have a half inch of depth of field. If you take, don't get closer, back up. Put your tele extender on. There's an app for that on your phone, by the way, depthoffieldmaster.com. So everybody says, well, you're 80 feet away, you're filling the frame, you only have 11 inches of depth of field. Well, when the bird's only this big, it's in there. Keeping it parallel to your sensor plane. Like I said, you're the back of the camera. You see my images parallel to you. You need two feet of depth of field. You're good. Rarely do you need more than that. So this is, you know, perfect profile. How much do I need? Perfect profile the way he flew. And same thing, I rarely, rarely need more than F8 unless I get closer. So just keep that in mind when you're photographing. So, like I said, the smaller the bird, 
degree of tracking them in flight, and I'm going to talk about the end. But what was the solution? What's one of the paradigm shifts in my program? The first question I'm going to ask you when you walk up to my table and show me a blurry bird picture is what was your ISO? That's the first question I'm going to ask you. Why? Well, what was your shutter speed? Raise the ISO. We're not film shooters anymore. Today's digital cameras have incredible performance. I use two 1DX bodies right now. I had two 1D Mark III bodies. I have just purchased a 7D Mark II recently. Because speed, you need to have a fast enough shutter speed to capture this. That's about speed, about 1 2500th to 1 3200th of a second shutter speed. What's a good speed for an entry level bird photographer for flight? I'm going to go with 1 1600th of a second or faster. I roll out of bed at ISO 800. <laughs> and I'll push it to 1600 if my lighting conditions don't improve, but realize that the pro end bodies, the 1DX, handle noise better, but noise reduction software is getting incredible. You need speed. Why do you need speed? You're photographing this, and you decide that I need ISO 200, because there's enough light. Well, he does this a couple of seconds later. How can you change your ISO that fast? And this is one of my favorite things that I like to talk about. We're photographing this duck. There is a school of pro photographers that say the right ISO for the right situation. I hate that comment. <laughs> I don't believe in that whatsoever. Why? The Boy Scout model, be prepared. So I'm going to give you a scenario with this image. I'm at ISO 800, 130, 200th of a second. The other pro is right here, same gear, same camera. ISO 200, 1 1600th of a second or less. I go, Roman, the duck's trying to fall asleep. Why do you need 1 3200th of a second? A bald eagle comes out of the sky, grabs the duck, and flies away. You know what you see then? I'm dancing, I'm dancing. I am rubbing it in so bad. Why? In my 25 plus years of doing this, not one editor not one publisher said, Roman, you had 1 3200th of a second. You only needed 1 1600th of a second. Give it back. <laughs> Anybody in this room, I lecture all over the country. Anybody in this room ever been back, asked to give back shutter speed? Anybody, please. I'm looking for the first person. So why are we so set on being at ISO 100 or 200? Set it and forget it. It's one less mistake you can make out in the field. It's one less button you have to look for. This is what I'm talking about. I'm trying to simplify and rule out mistakes you can make. Speed rules. Shutter speed is your friend. There is no penalty for having one four thousandth of a second shutter speed. 1 3200th of a second shutter speed. This is action that happens quickly. They're fighting. I'm just focused on acquiring, locking, and unloading. So speed is a, going to be a constant theme that you're going to hear from me because, like I said, this fight lasts only a couple of seconds, and they're probably doing 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. We need to freeze that motion. So, Osprey Nest, everybody says, well, what's the difference between the two lenses? And I'll be here for the rest of the weekend, actually, Monday, to answer those questions. But the sport is heavier, you know, much heavier than what the contemporary is. But now, let's talk about paradigm shift. They're working with teleconverters and auto-focusing. This is handheld with my 1D Mark III, the Sport, 
and the 1.4 sigma teleconverter. Handheld. Think about it, one twenty-five hundredth of a second, my motion is frozen. All I have to do is try to acquire, capture, and lock on my subject. Now I'm focused on that. Uh, so my second most controversial subject, what mode? Manual mode. I have no idea why my camera has any other mode, by the way, for the record. P does not stand for professional. All of them can work, but here's where manual mode shines, particularly in birds in flight. They're going to fly in your zone, sun at your back, your hands out, you got all that checked off. But in that zone, there's dark water, there's tan sand, there's black mangroves, there's blue sky. In any other mode, your camera is going to get fooled because if it reads that background, you're, you're in trouble. So the spoonbill, he's up against the blue water. What I do usually when I get out into the field, before I get out in the field, sun's at my back, check. Sun's low, check. Set it in manual mode. Pick F8, 5, 6, 6, 3, pick, pick one. Now I'll simply look at a car in the parking lot or in my zone, white car in particular, and take a shot of it. Check my histogram. I am correctly exposed for whites now. Adjust my shutter speed until it's where it has to be. No blown highlights, a fancy word for blankies. Uh, and I adjust my shutter. Now I could go out there, and why did I choose white? Most birds, the pretty ones, have white in them. If you get a bald eagle shots and your blacks or browns are impeccable, but your head's blown out, you might as well throw it out. No detail in the head. Set it for whites. Most birds have whites under the wingtips somewhere. So you want to do that because here he's flying in my zone up against water. What happens if he goes against the mangroves? Aperture priority, shutter speed priority, they're, they're all fooled. They're going to compensate for the dark mangroves. Is the picture about the mangroves or is it about the spoonbill? It's about the bird. And even if he goes up against the sky, it's all good. So why are people afraid of manual mode? When the light changes. You know, I've been looking through my viewfinder, like I said, almost 30 years now, I see the light change out in the field. I see it hide behind the cloud. I see it at sunrise, at sunset. I, my brain is thinking like my camera. So when the light's changing, everybody's saying, well, then I got to move my shutter speed, you know, f-stop, blah, 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 this and that. No, because I'm at ISO 800 and let's say 3200th of a second shutter speed, well, if it goes behind the cloud, I take a peek at my, me uh, my meter, left, right, center, it's somewhere on your camera, your light meter. I make a note where it is. So when it goes behind the cloud, let's use this as an example, one and two thirds over. That's the correct exposure, that's what it's telling me, no blown highlights. Check your camera and your meter. Every meter is not created equal. But you do the histogram check. To the white, to the right is white, to the left is black. Well, you know what? I only care where the right side is. It's not about the mangroves for me. I don't care where the left side is. So once I do that, if the sun drops, you're going to see your meter go, or the sun hides behind the cut. It's going to go boom, 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 you know, drop down to zero. Well, I just dump shutter speed on my Canon, get that needle back up to one and two thirds. Guess what? It's the correct exposure for white. Does that make sense to you guys? As it starts to set, the same thing is going to happen. Your meter is going to start dropping down. And you're just going to be sacrificing shutter speed, but always keeping it at that point because that's the correct exposure for white. I really want that's 
manual people make it too worrisome. They worry about it. I call this aperture light. I'm just thinking about dump and shutter speed, not much anything else, because I have enough of it. So keeping the needle lined up, I took it like that, whether he flies or whatever, but now it drops. I can quickly dump shutter speed, get it to where I have it lined up, and it's the correct exposure. So I hope that makes sense for you guys. So, gear, I'm gonna start spending your money. This is in my yard in New Jersey, or on the sidewalk. I set up a 12 inch carving 100 feet away from me, and I shot it at 200 millimeter on a full frame. This is my 1DX, so it's full frame. 400 millimeter. That's still not filling much of the frame. 600 millimeter, we're getting better, especially if he flapped the swings. Put it on a crop body, now we're getting pretty darn good, right? So there is a reason for that long focal length. And at that distance, he's in there. It's all sharp. So now the wor uh, world of those little birds in your backyard, now they're fair game. So 600 millimeter, crop body, the 7D Mark II, and the 1.4 teleconverter, oh yeah, now we're talking. And the only thing I've ever asked from my lenses, are you sharp? Yep. It's having a bad hair day, but it's definitely sharp. So, and remember, this is handheld. I've handheld my 300 to 800 twice in my life. It was two times too many. But because I had a fast enough shutter speed, I was able to do it. So part of that thing, and again, my 3D 100, it's 13 pounds. I know a bunch of you went by the table, we have two out there, and picked it up. Well, if you decide to go for that one, give up your gym membership and just pick up your lens all day long. You'll be fit as can be. And I'll probably save you a few bucks. The Sport comes in at 6.3 pounds. Well, I can hand hold that lens. I'm not the smallest guy on earth. But now I'm finding myself grabbing the contemporary. Why? 4.3 pounds on a crop body gives me 960 millimeters of focal length. That's more than my 3 day 100 on the straight body and it weighs a fraction of the weight. By the way, these big lenses, I'm not saying they're not sharp. I'm not saying I don't love the primes. I like the versatility of a zoom. But when I get on with my 3D 800, and this is what mine actually looks like and how you need to set it up so it's weightless, the airlines look at me like I'm out of my mind. And internationally, I'm not sure I can get on it to an international flight with this anymore because of some of the weight restrictions. I, I title this, you spent how much for that lens? <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> but, you know, part of that is you now, this little birds, the birds you wouldn't even look at before now when you go down to the beach, they're fair game. Because even though this is with the 3 to 800, technically with my 7D Mark II and my 150 to 600 contemporary, I have more focal length reach now, 960 millimeter. So all these little birds, and this one was the 3 to 800 with my 1.4 teleconverter on manually focused. Same with this one. So again, that monster reach is something you will truly enjoy. And it really opens up a whole new world. The backyard birds. Most birds are pretty comfortable with you approaching to about 50, 75 feet. They all have their own comfort zone. But these guys are prolific, and now, this is when I really fell in love with the zoom lens. I'm not sitting there saying, okay, here's your zone. 
acquire it right there, finish shooting there. No, you're acquiring it somewhere over here. And in the field, you'll see, you hear me say, wait for it, wait for it. So AI servo, continuous, high-speed shutter. Wait for it. So you're tracking here at 300 millimeter, 200, finding it. Keep bumping that shutter. I use the focus button when I'm doing it. But then you wait for it, wait, fire in a hole. As it's ripping through, take your finger off somewhere over here and follow through. So I can't judge a wing position. I can't go click, oh, there it is, perfect. Not going to happen. So, and the smaller the bird, degree of difficulty goes up. Dark, wor dark bird, dark water, again, practice. I didn't roll out of bed and do this the first time. But to tell you the truth, digital with the high ISO settings, and I'll tell you a true story. First time I went out to New Mexico to photograph the cranes, I took 92 rolls of 36 exposure film, ISO 100. I came home with two images I was proud of, of a flying bird. Not two boxes, two birds. I almost threw up. I went back 15 years later, digital, high I, well, that's where the high ISO philosophy came from. I stunk at ISO 100. Let's jack this baby up because we can. Put it to ISO 800. I had 2,500 keepers that first morning. Now, I didn't like every wing position. I threw them out. But the whole point here is they are travel friendly now. I can take my sport and contemporary instead of the 3 to 800, and nobody on the airlines looks at me like I'm crazy. So that's something that you have to take into consideration now. So this is a 3 to 800 shot, right? Tripod, gimbal head, very proud of that. Love the dark background. There's the contemporary shot. Well, I'm really proud of that one too. And it's really sharp. So for a fraction of the cost, I'm hand-holding it on the boat. I don't have to worry about travel restrictions. The days of photography being for those big primes, it's over. I'm not saying there's not a use for them. I'm not saying that they're not awesome. I'm just saying now people who are in college or planning to get into wildlife photography or on a budget like I was, Heck, if I had bought the 3 to 800 when I was first married, I wouldn't be married anymore. You know, it was 6,400 at the time when I bought it. I had two kids, little kids. You know, so family things. I worry about how quick can I acquire, track, lock, and load. So I'm standing on the boardwalk at the St. Augustine Alligator, or no, Gatorland. I hear an osprey hit the water. I don't see him, I hear him, bam! I swing around, there's frame number one, two, and I shot off 14 in a row on it. Just brrr. But this was my record. 44 images in a row, all sharp. Now, there's a little practice behind this. I just sold two camera bodies with over 275,000 shutter actuations, all right? I admitted how many shutter actuations are on there, but I'm going to phrase this the way I like to always break it down. You had a week worth of piano lessons. Did I invite you to Carnegie Hall? You had two weeks worth of piano lessons. You're still not getting in. People in Carnegie Hall practice 80 hours a week. Anytime I can pull my lens out and go photographing, I don't have that, oh, I photographed this before. It's keeping my skills sharp, all right? So we're always going to start raising the bar, and that's with flight. So listen, I have every bird, portrait, left, right, you know, after the pretty pictures, I'm like, okay, we have the ISO parallel to the plane. We're looking for action. I'm an action junkie. And, and bird photography in particular, when the shutters are going, 
it's an adrenaline rush. It really is. So we got them dancing. We got them eating. Eating's good. Eating's fine. This is like playing whack-a-mole with a bird, by the way. <laughs> they come up out of the bottom of the water, flip it up, and you're just like, yeah, there it is. And this is out in Long Island for us, and I think tis the season now. It's maybe a little late for the oyster catchers, but certainly the terns. So, of course, then I want mating. So the holy grail for me as a bird photographer is eating something, mating, and flying. I came close. I was like, go here, boy. <laughs> I swore I was going to retire if I pulled it off, but it hasn't happened yet. So now you're going to the birds in flight, so nothing changes. You keep that sun at your back. You keep your zone, wind direction. They're airplanes. They want to land and take off into the wind. So any of these directions, left, right, if it's sun's at your back and the wind's hitting you your back, you're going to get this pose. It's perfect. So any of those positions are good. And like I said, that's right at my back. But when I know what wind direction I have, I know where they're going to land. So I know which way they're going to fly. These are not accidents. I position the group in the zone to know which way they're flying. So again, wind's pretty much right at my back, maybe hitting my left ear as the sun's going down. No flyaway birds. This is what I mean. This is sharp, but it's flying away from you. Move yourself and get into the zone. And realize that a lot of these with the contemporary are handheld on a boat. So, there you go. Little, big, small. Start with the big guys. But start tracking early. Like I said, you don't want to wait. So, I'm, you know, looking over there. And I zoom out to 300. Because if you think finding something at 600 millimeters is easy, it's not. It's like, you know, looking through that, you know. So start at 300, zoom out, keep acquiring the focus. And like I said, once you lock that focus, you should just continue through. Now, my wife has no idea this next slide is coming, but she knows how much this one means to me. For proper hand-holding technique, drink beer. I'm going to go with maybe margaritas can work. Wine, I'm not so sure. Why? I'm hand holding up against that beer gut like this. I start tracking like that, firing the whole boom, fire away. It's great. I got an excuse to drink beer, and I'm sticking to that story, by the way. But you're combining everything that you're doing in that moment. Time of day, sun at your back, wind angle. Knowing all that makes your job a lot easier, and it's not as hard as it sounds. This is your cautionary tale. Speed. I mentioned speed. One of the things I didn't really talk about too much was speed of your card. Today's cameras are incredibly fast frame per second rate, 12 on the DX, 10 on the 7D Mark II, they're pushing the limits of how many frames per second these cameras can do. You don't want a card that's slow, so I can only stay friends with him if I don't mention his name, so we will. There's a Nikon shooter with a D3, me with my 1D Mark III, we both have the Sigma 3 to 800 on, we're on tripods, we're in the water. We see this Osprey dive out of our zone. And we're all like, oh, man, we think he got a fish. He goes, oh, I'm almost full. Reaches into his bag, grabs a card, changes his card. So we're both standing there. And for the first time in my life, we're both like, come on, get into the zone. Move, move, cut in front of us. And he does. So for me, you hear, Brrr, I filled the buffer of 30 on the 1D Mark III. 
I have two upwing positions like this, two downwing positions like this. I heard him go, curse, curse, radio edit, a couple of things I can't say, you know, blah, blah, blah. Why? He reached into his bag and he pulled out a card that read or wrote slow. And he didn't get the shot. Memory's cheap today. You need to think about that when you're out there in the field because this action happens fast and furious. So I hope you have, you should have the settings here of how to do this for yourself. Yes, I make it look pretty easy. I've done this a while. But you can do it. And I know this because people who go on workshops with me, they get these images. Takes them a while, but they get it. So if you have any questions, I'll be here tomorrow as well at the Sigma table. So stop by and ask me. Thank you very much. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.